first in-person conference in two years, and we already have a special setup. Some of you know me, some of, do, some of you do not, so I need to introduce myself a little bit. My name is Marta, and I hate debugging. So now you are asking me why I'm covering subject like that. As I hate debugging, I was trying to find out the best techniques, tools, ideas on how to make debugging easier. First fact, one that you are not going to like, we spent most of our time debugging. Unfortunately, with best tools, it's still going to be like that. But we can improve, we can improve things in an important way. And I'm going to talk about ways to improving debugging in embedded Linux today. So here we go. Sweetie. So what is important in debugging? You may say tools, you may say knowledge you have already, you may say experience, and what I will going, I would like to I, uh, argue today is that the most important thing is the approach you take. If you have an organized approach, it's going to be way, way better. Oh, my dear clicker. Okay. But let's start with things I have seen over the years. Frequent errors when people are debugging their applications. The first, the most common one is trying random solutions. I don't know what's happening, but I'm going to change that. And that may be. They change the file system. Uh, let's change the network card. Let's change the component. Usually, it's not really fixing the problem. The second common error is adding wait, sleeps, you sleeps, or whatever you have in your framework. And when you hear, when I add the sleep, the test case actually passes. That's a common sign. And I will tell you a small secret. After 10 years working in silicon companies, if you are fixing a problem by adding a slip, it's going to show up just before the important presentation. And it won't be happening just from time to time to time. It will ha be happening all the time. No slips, except, except if you can really tell why you're adding it. In embedded space, quite often you have a protocol specification, you have a chip specification telling you that. You need to wait one second for the controller to initialize or for something to boot. In this case, that's okay. Good to write a comment above that slip, why it is there, linked to the documentation, so that everyone else after won't be wondering what is this thing doing here. Then, inefficient tools. Either doing everything manually or people are often writing crappy tools because it's just for debugging and this code is just for debugging, I'm going to throw it away or they are avoiding writing tools whatsoever. As we are going to cover a little bit later, in a good debugging methodology, you need to reuse your tools. If they are crappy, uh, you will have crappy experience. And then managers will want me for this. Estimating time for your debugging, especially when you are hard hardware software problem. Some people will ask you to estimate how long it's going to take. If you are really experienced and 
you think you nearly have the solution, you might try to tell how much it's going to take. Unfortunately, you might end up saying three days, and three months later, you will be still at the problem. After quite a long time, for me, it worked with managers. I'm sorry, I'm debugging. I don't know how, it's, how long it's going to take. After repeating and repeating and repeating, it's, it finally worked. You can try, hopefully, too. So, this is my secret methodology <laughs> that I'd like to, to share with you today. So let's go through rapidly. First, defining what is the problem you are working on. Then listing what are the possible reasons for this problem. After that, I look into ways how you can actually verify that this reason is actually the reason for your problem. Then you write the test case, you run the test case, you analyze what you got, and then you look back or you have a solution. Now, it's going to be easier with an example. So let's go to an example. An example is not going to be the HDMI in the laptop because that's a little bit too complex. And I'm going to run with something a little bit more fun. I have been installing a weather station recently in my garden. The garden is in the mountains, so we have a slope. And it's pretty long, it's like more than 100 meters long. You have trees, so we have different things that, um, that can interact with the weather system. And the weather station has the base station. It has temperature sensors. It has a wind sensor. And it has the rain level sensor. The base station was working, the temperature sensor was working, the wind sensor was working, but the rain sensor wasn't working. So, let's go into the bugging of my weather sensor. So what's the problem? I define it as the weather, the rain sensor doesn't work. What could be the reason? We are in embedded space. The first possible reason, there's no power. Second possible reason I can think of just like that, it's a radio. So maybe it's too far from the base station. It's not receiving a signal and doesn't work. Okay, so I have those two possibilities. Let's go with the one with radio. So how can I verify that's true? I start looking at the, at the sensor, there's no LED, nothing showing that it's, it's really working. But when, while looking at the base station, I can see that there is a small icon, a sensor of the radio link with the, with the rain sensor, okay? So it means that there is a radio signal. So this is my test case, the icon on the base station, we have radio. Okay, so what have I learned? I have learned that both of my possible causes are not the real cause because if there is radio, there is also power on the device. So it's not that the problem. So we look back and debug further. I ha as I had no clue, Let's disassemble the sensor. So as I do not want to use photos of the actual device because copyright and all the stuff, what is important to know how it, how it works? Oh, yeah, it will be on the right place in a moment. Okay, here we are. So it works with a scale. You have a raindrop going down, running on the scale, and when you have enough drops, the scale goes down, the water goes out, and the other part of the scale has come up, and when it switches, it clicks, and it counts 
the number of clicks it does. It's pretty, uh, pretty easy to understand how it works. So I was looking at it. The possible reason it actually mechanically doesn't, doesn't click. Brought, what, what can we do to verify it? Bring a bottle of water and see if it's going to click and if we get the, the actual result. Okay, so I do the experiment, it works. What have we learned? Mechanically it works, so what could it be? In fact, there were more steps like that during the whole thing until I realized that it works with the bottle of water but it doesn't work with the real rain or at least it works but for, for only one click during a real rain and after the rain I got that aha moment you remember the slope? So the sensor itself was also on the slope, like that. So what if this skate doesn't work with a low amount of rain if it is not exactly horizontal? How do we test it? Easy when you have a garden on a slope, you just you just switch it 90 degrees and wait for the next train. It worked. It worked and it, it's working ever since. So, time to get into what we have learned from the methodology. So, what is the problem? Write down everything you know about the problem. Then list all the reasons you can think about. By the way, I'm typically using an electronic file, but you can do paper, whatever you want to. Listing po all possible reasons you can find out. Then you choose one that is the most interesting for you, or maybe the most probable one. You grab that reason, you keep it, and you find a way to verify that reason. And you keep the reason, not the, all the other reasons, this one. You grab it. And you design an experiment to verify that specific reason. When you have the experiment, because it may be that it's pretty hard to do and you would prefer to go back to another reason, maybe it will be easier to do, it may happen. When you have the experiment that you can actually do, you do the test case. It's either something to note down or how exactly to do it, to reproduce, or if it's just code, you just commit the test case. And then, what are we learning from the result? Does it support the fact that the reason that you were thinking about is the real reason? Have you discovered any new possible reasons that you could be able to look into. Or maybe, in a bed it happens quite often, maybe the, you need to recheck your previous results because one of your experiments were broken for some reason or was incomplete. And that's why I'm telling you to commit the results and have all the history. So you're not going to be lost because one of the experiments was just broken. And then we look back. Either we have found the solution, we are happy, and we implement the actual solution. And at the end, we run the actual first test case from the beginning to make sure if we have actually fixed the issue. And then if you do not have enough information, go to any point above. Typically, you will go to the list of possible causes and you will be evaluating what is the next one to work on. Okay. 
That is about the methodology. Then it's about tools. Because you need tools to understand what is happening in your system. What exactly does not work? Or how the system at large works so that you can get more insight into the issue. And of course, you also need tools to design your experiment. There are so many tools out there. I'm going to cover a few most frequently used ones. Then it's up to you to work on your toolbox to go around and find things you can use. There are a lot of interesting presentations happening around, for example, one about tracing later on today. So the first, some people are not going to like me again here because printf debugging. That's for beginners, right? All people working in embedded space for years know that, well, for beginners back, everyone is doing that. So printing is printf in C, print K on peer something in the Linux kernel, and a specific function in the language tooling that you use. What it allows you to show is the, at the state of your va some variables or the state of the code path when you are finding yourself in, basically. But, 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 beginners beware. The code may behave differently with and without. And why is it so? For quite many reasons. First, my advice will be to show only what you actually need because one reason too much data may be really hard to analyze if you are just lost in pages and pages and pages of data uh, even if your piece of gold is somewhere in there you may just not see it and then watch out the bandwidth in code especially with loops it's really easy to generate pages and pages and megabytes of logs. When you're embedded with a serial port or with a slow network connection, you can actually saturate. Messages may be lost in this case. And imagine a situation when you have had the right message in the exactly right point, showing the exactly right variable in the right moment, and you are just not seeing it because it's going to be lost. It happened to me, not funny at all. So make sure you get all messages and save your bandwidth for the important stuff. Then uh, quite frequent technique to limit the amount of messages and make it easier to, to work over your debugging is using log levels. What is a log level in natural, you have a variable that is controlling printing some of the information. So you have some variables and you, in the code you have in some variable is higher than some value, then you print the message, otherwise you don't. Why it's useful? Because you may have all this conditional debugging in the code and you just enable it by setting the variable by a debugger in the, from the command line, uh, if it's in Uxcarna in sys, and it just happens. Saves your time. And um, if you think that adding a printf looks like a fix for your problem, I would tell you to retest because my bet is that you are having a race condition. Okay, then let's go to the kernel special files for debugging Linux kernel and debugging your application working over Linux. It's, it's also pretty interesting. Um, yeah, my dear clicker. Okay, 
So there are two main directories with special files that are useful, proc and sys. Not going into the details of history about why you have both. Not important for our use case. In proc, you have various statistics, especially related to your processes. For example, PROC self-limits, it's giving limits of the process itself. There are way, way, way many other things. Imp useful to learn what you can find interesting that applies to your, to your case. The other is SIS. It includes files for each bus. It allows you to enable, disable certain features dynamically. For example, uh, syskernel debug dynamic debug. It allows you to enable log levels conditional debugging in the kernel code. Quite useful. You can enable things without recompiling. Saves time also. Then we come to domain specific situations and probably in your own domain there will be way other things. Two examples of strays and puff and how you can use them. So my first friend strays, it allows you to see all the system calls that the program is running with the parameters and the results of the system calls. It has saved me a number of times from applications that do not check error codes of system calls. For example, someone is opening a file and not checking if the file was actually opened and going with their work. Um, if, the, if there are wrong permissions or the file doesn't exist, it usually ends badly. So it, it saves you a lot of time for such kind of cases, just looking for minus one as a error code and verifying if they all look reasonable. Then perf, uh, I'm not doing, going to talk a lot about perf because if I run into the subject of perf, um, we are not going to get our Guinness this evening. So. You can get a lot of information uh, from many places and Perf gives you a lot, especially related to your CPU and the general monitoring performance stuff. For example, just Perf start sleep chan uh, gives you the CPU statistics for the last 10 uh, seconds. Pretty useful. And there's an excellent documentation um, with Perf, with one-liners. You do not have to remember the comment, just you search on the, on the site of the most important comments and um, you will look at, as an expert just by knowing the, the site and being able to find the right, the right command for your use case. And they are, they are plenty. Okay. Another domain, uh, networking. Pickup, TCP dump, Wireshark. What is, what is Pickup? Pickup is a format that allows you to save your network traffic and then reanalyze. TCP dump is a tool that allows you to dump, to dump, to display um, the, the traffic in a text format. Wireshark is a graphical interface. So what I'm going to show you is the graphical interface. For people do not, uh, to, who haven't done a PG networking, um, it may be sometimes a little bit complex to understand, but you, uh, the tool analyzes the protocols for you. So you already have some information. And in this case, I, for example, I have a TLS connection. I can see a port number in the tool. Usually in red, it shows you things that are not going well in the network connection. So it may be a hint. Of course, need to be careful for some reasons and have your protocol reference handy next to you when you are debugging. So what do I use uh, Wireshark or TCB dump for? 
to ask the questions like, is the really network connectivity working correctly at all levels? Is the protocol I'm working on actually working as it should be? Yet again, you need to have the protocol spec somewhere handy to be able to verify if it's actually true. Or is there some unexpected traffic, something that you were not expecting in your network, but actually happening and interacting with what you want to have in a way that generates specific effects. So, uh, typical findings using uh, Wireshark or TCP dump. Same MAC address in, a, in the same network. For everyone who hasn't run into that yet, when it happens to you, your network behaves randomly. And quite often it happens in embedded because same MAC address twice happens quite often when we have uh, Ethernet controllers where that's the software that has to put the MAC address or you are prototyping a device, someone forgot to put the MAC address or all devices are clones and we connect two identical devices to the network and then puff. It may actually take some time to debug and in the network trace, you see, you see requests, two requests for the same, on the same Mac, and you just have to find the offender. Then another interesting situation is when you have your network connection or protocol connection blocked by some misconfiguration or a firewall. Typically, you are, you are seeing exchanges between two parties and then one of those parties say, stop, I don't want to talk to you anymore. If a network trace, you can see who said that. And then you go to that site to find out what happened in the log or, or by other means. You look in the configuration files, whatever it could be. Okay, so let's wrap up and repeat what is important, at least what I find important. So my, the, the magical debugging procedure, adjust as you want to. Define what is the problem, clearly. List the possible reasons. Show, think about how you can verify if it's really the reason. Write the test case, save it for later. Find out what you have learned from the result of the experiment and then look back depending on the needs. On the tool side, printing quite often helps with initial questions. I haven't worked on, uh, I haven't worked through the buggers in this session because otherwise it would have been a shopping list. Debugging is, helps in similar situations especially if you want to look into sp some specific code. You have also logs for, from your system, from your applications. Look into them and find out what is important and what is interesting, what you can reuse. And then there are specific tools for each domain. You have a performance information from, in tools like Perf. You have the networking, tools, Wireshark TCP DAMP, if you are on Ethernet, they are all the tools if you are on InfiniBand or other things. And there, were, there are way more tools in your toolbox available for different domains. And add them as you find useful. So if you want to discuss this subject or a specific subject of why a security person talks about debugging, Okay, the answer is very simple. Security bugs are bugs first. So less bugs less, means less security bugs. That's why I'm working on that. And also the Friday um, as the per session. So if I'm calculating correctly, we have some time for questions now.
Everyone's shy, it seems so. Uh, if you ask, yeah, we have a question because I have, of course, things to add. Do we have someone? Yes, hello. Um, Dan Sullivan, I work for Ford Motor Company. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Uh, Dan Sullivan, I work for Ford Motor Company. Um, and something that I've seen, uh, you know, differences between going through university and then working in uh, real world, world environments. How do you uh, propose we translate some of this experience in real world environments back into the university? Uh, environment because something you know it's it's especially when you're starting out printf is very common and it's it's at least in my experience it's usually code fast and debug later um, usually two three four hours before assignments do um, so do you have any ideas on how we can better teach these advanced techniques uh, through a university level okay uh, that's a very insightful question it's a very insightful question and in fact just two worlds, uh, two, two worlds away, we are discussing the same thing for security. <laughs> so, I've noticed the same thing. People coming from school, they do not really have debugging skills, no, no security skills, uh, no the experience. So, what, I, what I'm trying to do is to educate people on, te on actual techniques. Because I find personally that tools they can learn. It's, it's easy to give them tools for, for a specific task when they need them. Uh, it's more complicated to, to learn people actually work step by step I'll give you an example here. Uh, when you have the uh, result of, of that analysis as, I, uh, as I've presented available, done by, uh, by a junior, de junior developer, they can show it to a more advanced developer easily. And that person is going to look okay, have you considered this situation? Have you considered this situation and this? And this you, ha you have considered, this yes, but, but there's one more possible reason that you should consider. And it's very easy to help them in this case. Other than they are telling you for 30 minutes what they have tried to do, and then, well, you are going to redo the same experiment. So I think that what we are missing is actually learning them the approach and the tools are going to come. I, I think that is easier. Hopefully answering your question. We have an online question. What do you think about debugging real-time embedded systems? A lot of tools you present today, such as Strace, cannot be used on those. Um, I have been using Strace on, uh, okay, or maybe on a, re, um, on a hard embedded because there's the definition of what is, what is real time. Yeah, uh, so if you are on a hard embedded, um, then you can, uh, you will need a little different toolbox. Um, so usually, for example, printing won't be useful because it's going to completely break your runtime constraint except that that you can add, you can try to adjust those techniques for example as, as uh, without uh, without using printf what you can do is to reimplement the printing to some buffer somewhere and then get get those um, the information later on uh, same with tracing, you can also try to do it in a 
non-intrusive way. Um, my advice will be mostly to think if your problem is really linked to the hard real-time requirements or not. If it's not, you can just use tools as in typical Linux system. If it is hard real time, really, if the problem is really showing in that hard real time problem, uh, then that will be and there will be a need for a specific tooling for, for your test case, depending on where you exactly can put the data and what you are exactly looking looking in, um, that will really depend on the situation. It's pretty, it could be pretty complex. Okay, uh, we have a question like fifth row, I think, on this side. Um, it's quite funny. I ran into a MAC address duplication problem. Uh, I ran into a MAC address duplication problem a few weeks ago, and um, I found that a very helpful tool can be looking at your ARP table, and that's a little easier when uh, running Wireshark in the first instance. Uh, this is uh, yeah. Uh, looking at your at your ARP table when it happens, uh, that's also a reflex to have. Um, I use this example because quite often we are not considering this is what is actually happening. So we are thinking it's something else and then, and then we figure out. And of course, after, after the fact to having that, um, the duplicate uh, in the trace, you run the, the ARP command, you just see, okay, there are two of them. And it's clear you have verified you have verified the case. Yeah, for quite many situations, you have multiple tools you can use. And with experience, with different kind of projects, you will have more of them to use. I'm unable to cover all of them in one hour. Sorry. Okay. I would say that we are done now, and I think that will be the lunchtime, right? So thank you all.